example, when we built our original trading system in 1995, we used human readable ASCII files as our real-time database storage format. We actually traded off a system that used a database format of ASCII readable files. Why? Because the system crashed every 30 minutes or so. And the only way we could figure out why it failed was if we could read the database files. And the only way we could restart the, the trading system fast enough to keep trading and keep making money was if we could hand edit the files to remove the erroneous entries. The funny thing was, this design was so useful for so many other reasons, we never found a value in switching to a more complex data, database storage format. Years and years later, we continued to reap the benefits of that simple solution and thank the engineering gods that we never, knew, never moved away from it. Is that what I learned at Renaissance is that when we're ready to trade, information doesn't matter. Like you think we would be, we'd have you know, hundreds of people pouring over news feeds, watching news, trying to figure out what happens, what happened in the world. The truth is that while some people do trade that way and they can make fundamental bets um, on stocks that they want to hold for a long time, we were trading in and out of stocks pretty quickly. Um, not quite high frequency trading, but we were trading out, you know, holding like we say from a, like a, a day to a week to a month. Um, but, you know, usually on the, on the, on the shorter side. And when we, the, our, generally what we looked at was not news. We just looked at price movements because we assumed that any news we could see as people, someone else had already seen that news. They'd already traded off of it. And whatever I needed to learn from that news was already encoded in some way in the prices in the stock market. So all of our models just looked at price and volume and you know, trading volume and, and how much trading was happening on different parts of the, the spread and, and you know, how, how deep the book was of, of, of orders that were waiting. We looked at the, the actual people betting on the market and we assumed that anything that could be known about stocks, especially because we're trading you know, four or five or 10,000 different stocks at a time, that we couldn't possibly figure out what was going on in the world from the news but we knew that there were people who were experts on every single stock who were reading the news and they were trading off of it. And so if we just looked at the stock prices, we could glean what we needed to know about stocks. So it's important for you to understand if you guys are you know, thinking about doing trading on your, you know, your accounts that you guys are managing, when you see news happen, you have to assume that everyone bigger than you already knows that. So you can't assume, oh, there's just the news about Disney. I'm going to go trade because Disney's going to go up because of that news. No, everyone who trades Disney already heard that news, you know, minutes to hours before you did. They've already traded off of it. And if they're going to buy Disney stock based on that, the stock price has already moved up to where that news reflects the price should be based on that news. So you want to be thinking not so much reacting to individual news or immediate news, but thinking long term about what it means. A lot of times, people overbuy things and stock prices go up more than they should based on news. And if you could think, wow, they've overreacted to this news and tomorrow they're going to look at this and say, wow, this is really dumb. We shouldn't have bought this, this stock. We shouldn't have bought Disney. Then you can use that intuition to say, hey, I'm going to bet against Disney because it went up too much. But, and that's kind of the, the kind of thing we would look for is, is people overbetting and we, we call them reversionary signals. If we saw a stock going up too much, we would sell it. Um, and especially looking at it relative to its industry. Um, but basically, we learned that um, information news is not what you think it is. Eventually, we figured out that there are ways in which news can be useful. Like I said, if you see some big news happen and then you see a stock go up a lot, the combination of that news and the stock going up might mean it's going to go down. So positive news about a stock may actually be a sign a stock's going to fall. Um, and so that's where it's, it's kind of like that's why com using computers and math and statistical models to, to bet in, in the stock markets is sometimes better because you don't, you know, human beings think a certain way and all the traders out there are human beings. For, well, these days, not as much, but you know, there are a lot of human beings behind the trading going on and you want to be thinking ahead of them and you can't get ahead of them with information because they're going to beat you to the information, but you can get ahead of them by, by thinking about their psychology and thinking how you can game their thinking and then kind of reverse and engineer what they're doing. So that's one thing that we learned about um, the markets that really were key to uh, me understanding how I should view the markets. And just, uh, you know, I, I usually mention this at the end, but I don't own any publicly traded stocks. I probably have less than 1% of the, 
of my overall net worth invested in publicly traded stocks. Um, and the reason I do that, and I'm not recommending that, God, God forbid, you know, you should, you should learn, learn about the markets and most people in the world do invest in the stock market. And it's, it's a good thing for retirement and for, for long-term planning to be invested in the stock markets. But I understand from my experience of Renaissance and also by seeing other companies like Renaissance blow up that the values that companies have in the stock market, sometimes they're based on the value of a company, but a lot of times they're based on some market player choosing to buy a lot of a company or, or short a lot, of a, a lot of a company for reasons that have nothing to do with that company. Um, a lot of times companies will use kind of what we call boring stocks. So let's say, let's say you, you have like, a, let's, let's call Microsoft, for instance, a boring technology company or IBM. They're old companies. They're not so volatile. They're not going to double in, well, they've gone up a lot lately, but they're not typically going to double in price. They're, they, they have low volatility, but they're representative of the technology industry. So if the technology industry is going to go up 20%, Microsoft's probably going to go up 20%. IBM's probably going to go up 20%. And let's say you're, you have some really cool, um, volatile new technology company that you want to buy. I mean, Tesla's a bad example, but it's not really in the same industry. But let's say you have a Tesla-like company that's new to the industry that's really a high flyer and you want to buy it. But you don't want to take the risk that technology stocks are going to tank because you just think that you, the company you're betting on is going to go up a lot more than everybody else, not necessarily go up you know, if, if, if technology goes down. So what you might do is you might buy that stock and short IBM or short Microsoft. And that way you're covering your risk that technology stocks, the whole industry is going to go down, but you're still going to bet on your high flying stock that's going to go up. And so a lot of times when you look at the values of, of stocks, sometimes they don't reflect the value of the company. They might reflect the fact that there's some really big hedge funds out there that are going long a bunch of volatile stocks in the industry, and they got to short somebody. So they're going to deflate the value of these boring stocks in a way which is going to affect if you own those stocks and they go down in value, you're going to still going to lose money if you have to sell the stock, even if, you know, there's no nothing fundamentally wrong with the company. And, you know, we learned this because there was... Um, this period of time in 2008, where all of a sudden, literally, almost literally, every quantitative hedge fund in the world started losing money. And not just like a little bit of money, like Renaissance lost 20 times more than it ever lost in its history. And it was losing money every day. And we, we were, it was such a bad run that if it went on for another week, we would have gone out of business. And a bunch of funds did go out of business. And long story short, what ended up happening was there was some big hedge fund that was like Renaissance in some ways that went out of business and they sold off their whole portfolio. And they did it in a really clumsy way that caused all of these boring companies that everyone was using to short the hedge of their exposure to go up in value because this fund was buying them all back. And so there was this huge mispricing of all these different instruments that happened for a few weeks or maybe a week for two weeks that affected every quantitative hedge fund in the world that used similar models. And when it stopped, we made all of our money back, most of our money back. But there was a period of time where we were losing, we were losing like over a billion dollars a day. We were losing over a billion dollars a day. I mean, think about that. And it was all because of, of this phenomenon that hedge funds push prices of instruments around in ways which don't reflect their fundamentals. And if a big fund decides to dump all its stock, then it's going to have a then then it, the, the market's going to have a problem. Um, so that's that's the main reason why I don't feel comfortable investing in stocks because I'm not looking. You know, if I was looking to be a long term investor, it doesn't really matter when you get in. You hold stocks for 20 years, and then they're, they're going to move where they're going to move. Uh, but I don't like to be an active trader in stocks because I feel like their values are manipulated. Let me uh, ask you some questions, Mr. Brown. In your statement, you say that the uh, reference portfolio for each option was generated by Renaissance's trading algorithm, and you make it sound like the selections were made by a machine with no human intervention. Now, your scientists and your experts are continually looking for inefficiencies in the market, and when they find something new, as I understand you and your testimony, they try to adjust the computer model and incorporate that into the algorithm. 
and that will affect the decisions that are generated. It could also have an impact on what positions are bought and sold. So there's a lot of ongoing human involvement in this process. Is that correct? That is correct. And how many employees are there at Rentec? Uh, I think roughly 300. And of these employees, how many work part-time or full-time on the algorithm strategy that supports Rentex or supported Rentex basket option transaction? Uh, well, on the strategy, uh, you know, 50 or so. Okay. Um, and these would be employees with backgrounds in mathematics, physics, and computer science? That's correct. The employees that uh, worked on the overall strategy to identify market inefficiencies in order to take advantage of them, uh, I assume, did this in, on an ongoing basis. Is that correct? Yes. And how, frequent, how, frequent, how frequently were they identifying these inefficiencies and modifying the inputs that go into the overall strategy? Was that a frequent occasion? Well, most of the modifications involved uh, maintenance changes to the, the system is, has a million lines of computer code. And uh, when you have a million lines of computer code, it has to be maintained. Uh, interfaces change. Um, I don't know if you're counting those kinds of changes. No, uh, just when you tweak the algorithm. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I'm sorry, what was the question? How many people were No, how frequently oh. were you doing that? Was that a daily uh, change? No, no, no. Uh, weekly, monthly? No, more, more like weekly. Okay. So every week there would be roughly? One or two changes roughly on average. In the algorithm. Yeah, the algorithm... Uh, has been developed over 25 years. It probably has a thousand man years of uh, work into it. It's uh, very mature at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard to make uh, significant improvements. So these are minor changes typically. But there's an you got 50 people working on this. There's a lot of human involvement in Rentec in this. Oh, that's not all they do. We're all, we're all, we all, we trade commodities, futures. I know that, but I, I specifically ask you the question on this particular, for this particular process, this, this basket option process, how many were working full time or part time on the strategy that supported Rentex basket option yeah, transactions? I, I think my answer is accurate. Okay, so we'll stick with 50. That's fine. I mean, roughly. I, I don't That's know exactly. Fine. Okay. About 50. That's a lot of people. A lot of human intervention. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, 50 people working on these basket options? Okay, I'll let it speak for itself. You don't have to agree with it. Okay. It's a lot of expertise. Um, now, do... Rent, or did Rentec personnel intervene in the strategy to respond to market events? Um, well, you know, like during the the, the uh, Greek crisis. Oh, sure. Uh, well, when you say the strategy, uh, what happened? I can know about the Greek crisis, for example, if you like. Uh, what happened there is that. Uh, we were concerned uh, at that time that uh, Barclays had uh, a lot of exposure to Greek, uh, to Greece. And so you could shift billions of dollars of its portfolio, for instance, from No, no, Barclays? that's not that's not what happened. Well, could you? Could did we you have? Shift, did you shift any money from Barclays to Deutsche Bank? Uh, shift money? No. Okay. Um, did you direct more of the sales orders to one bank and more to the purchase orders to another to the other bank? Yes, we made a change to the uh, uh, process that uh, uh, distributes uh, portfolio amongst the options. Uh, so the algorithm produces a bunch of trades and uh, produces a portfolio, and uh, more or less of it can go to different options. So prospectively, going forward, we made a change so they would tend to put uh, more portfolio with Deutsche Bank and less with Barclays. And that was some of the type of work that your 50 
That's correct. Experts would do. And so um, with the human intervention in this process, uh, this affects what positions are bought, sold, and how long they're held. Is that correct? I, yes, as I said, the changes are modest, but yes. Who changes their mind? Human beings? Who changes their mind? I, what did you just say? Changes, changes their are mind? modest. Your models? Small. You make changes in the models. That, yes, they are modest changes in the models. Modest changes in the models by these human beings. That's correct. This algorithm wasn't just cha making changes by itself. It took human beings to make changes. Yeah, sure. The human beings wrote the code. Good. And changed the code. That's correct. Tweaked the code. And twice, once or twice every week, changed. On the, average. Yeah. On average. Okay. When you made these changes in the algorithm, did you consult with the banks? Uh, no. Is the algorithm Rentex proprietary strategy? It is. Do the banks ever change the algorithm? No. Now, you got about 300,000 transactions executed in the banks per day for Rentex basket contracts. Were these submitted in the form of recommendations or suggestions to the banks? Uh, the, uh, well, Assuming they met the guidelines, of course, which you had already agreed upon. But were these submitted, 300,000 approximately, transactions? in the banks each so, day for the basket contracts, where they submitted in the form of recommendations or suggestions, but were they automatically sent to the market, providing so, they met the guidelines which you had agreed to? So they were sent to, uh, most commonly sent to the, the bank's trading systems. All right. And if they, uh, sometimes they were rejected, not very often, uh, and uh, otherwise, they went to the market. That's correct. And uh, not very often would be if they didn't meet the guidelines. I think that's the only uh, the only ones I know of uh, where you know restricted list uh, had been changed and we weren't aware of it. That kind of thing. That's, those are the ones I know of. All right. So there was a, an agreement. There were guidelines, a restricted list, whatever you want to call it. If it didn't meet that, then it wouldn't go to market. Uh, that's my understanding. Yes. And that didn't happen very often. No, it did not. How many times? I don't know how many times. Oh, how many times in a year? A few. A few in a year. I would guess. I, you know, I'm not. I know. You know I'm guessing there. Best of your ability, you're guessing a few times a year. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, if it's 20, it wouldn't surprise me. If it's three, it wouldn't surprise All me right. in that range. That's out of 30 million a year. Uh, I haven't done the multiplication, but that's that's probably correct. That's not multiplication. That's a question of fact. I well, I don't know if it's 30 million or 35 million or 40 million. It's, it's millions, many millions. Tens of millions. Yes. It could have been three or five or ten times it didn't meet the guidelines. That's correct. 